This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading is by Michael Sirwa. Michael.Sirwa, S I R O I S dot com. Penguin Island by Anatole France. Book Three. THE MIDDLE AGES AND THE RENAISSANCE BOOK Three, CHAPTER Two, DRACO THE GREAT TRANSLATION OF THE RELICS OF ST. ORBOROSIA The direct posterity of Brian the Good was extinguished about the year 900 in the person of Colic of the Short Nose. A cousin of that prince, Bosco the Magnanimous, succeeded him, and took care, in order to assure himself of the throne, to put to death all of his relations. There issued from him a long line of powerful kings. One of them, Draco the Great, attained great renown as a man of war. He was defeated more frequently than the others. It is by this constancy in defeat that great captains are recognized. In twenty years he burned down more than a hundred thousand hamlets, market towns, unwalled towns, villages, walled towns, cities, and universities. He set fire impartially to his enemies' territories and to his own domains, and he used to explain his conduct by saying, War without fire is like tripe without mustard. It is an insipid thing. His justice was rigorous. When the peasants whom he made prisoners were unable to raise the money for their ransoms, he had them hanged from a tree. And if any unhappy woman came to plead for her destitute husband, he dragged her by the hair at his horse's tail. He lived like a soldier without effeminacy. It is satisfactory to relate that his manner of life was pure. Not only did he allow his kingdom to decline from its hereditary glory, but even in his reverses he valiantly supported the honor of the Penguin people. Draco the Great caused the relics of St. Orborosia to be transferred to Alca. The body of the blessed saint had been buried in a grotto on the coast of Shadows at the end of a scented heath. The first pilgrims who went to visit it were the boys and girls from the neighboring villages. They used to go there in the evening, by preference in couples, as if their pious desires naturally sought satisfaction in darkness and solitude. They worshipped the saint with a fervent and discreet worship, whose mystery they seemed jealously to guard for they did not like to publish too openly the experiences they felt. But they were heard to murmur one to another words of love, delight, and rapture, with which they mingled the name of Orborosia. Some would sigh that there they forgot the world. Others would say that they came out of the grotto in peace and calm. The young girls among them used to recall to each other the joy with which they had been filled in it. Such were the marvels that the Virgin of Alca performed in the morning of her glorious eternity. They had the sweetness and indefiniteness of the dawn. Soon the mystery of the grotto spread like a perfume throughout the land. It was a ground of joy and edification for pious souls, and corrupt men endeavored, though in vain, by falsehood and calumny, to divert the faithful from the springs of grace that flowed from the saint's tomb. The church took measures so that these graces should not remain reserved for a few children, but should be diffused through all penguin Christianity. Monks took up their quarters in the grotto. They built a monastery, a chapel, and a hostelry on the coast, and pilgrims began to flock thither. As if strengthened by a longer sojourn in heaven, the blessed Orborosia now performed still greater miracles for those who came to lay their offerings on her tomb. She gave hopes to women who had been hitherto barren. She sent dreams to reassure jealous old men concerning the fidelity of the young wives whom they had suspected without cause. And she protected the country from plagues, murrains, famines, tempests, and dragons of Cappadocia. But during the troubles that desolated the kingdom in the time of King Colloc and his successors, the tomb of St. Orborosia was plundered of its wealth, the monastery burned down, and the monks dispersed. The road that had been so long trodden by devout pilgrims was overgrown with firs and heather, and the blue thistles of the sands. For a hundred years the miraculous tomb had been visited by none save vipers, weasels, and bats, 
when one day the saint appeared to a peasant of the neighborhood, Mamordic by name. I am the virgin Orborosia, said she to him. I have chosen thee to restore my sanctuary. Warn the inhabitants of the country that if they allow my memory to be blotted out, and leave my tomb without honor and wealth, a new dragon will come and devastate Penguinia. Learned churchmen held an inquiry concerning this apparition, and pronounced it genuine, and not diabolical, but truly heavenly, and in later years it was remarked that in France, in like circumstances, St. Foy and St. Catherine had acted in the same way, and made use of similar language. The monastery was restored, and pilgrims flocked to it anew. The Virgin Orborosia worked greater and greater miracles. She cured diverse hurtful maladies, particularly clubfoot, dropsy, paralysis, and St. Guy's disease. The monks who kept the tomb were enjoying an enviable opulence, when the saint, appearing to King Draco the Great, ordered him to recognize her as the heavenly patron of the kingdom, and to transfer her precious remains to the cathedral of Alca. In consequence, the odoriferous relics of that virgin were carried with great pomp to the metropolitan church, and placed in the middle of the choir, in a shrine made of gold and enamel, and ornamented with precious stones. The chapter kept a record of the miracles wrought by the blessed Orborosia. Draco the Great, who had never ceased to defend and exalt the Christian faith, died fulfilled with the most pious sentiments, and bequeathed his great possessions to the Church. End of Book 3, Chapter 2